Welcome, distinguished colleagues. Today, we embark upon a rigorous discussion of memory, its intricacies, and its profound impact on the human experience. Memory shapes who we are, informs our actions, and interacts with the environment in complex ways. Let us delve into the evolution of our understanding of memory. Indeed, Carl. Memory is not merely a repository of experiences, but a labyrinth where the conscious and the unconscious mind interact. The depths to which unconscious processes affect memory formation are profound, often eluding the grasp of our most aware selves. Sigmund, you highlight an essential aspect of our dialogue, the unconscious. It's the unseen force that guides much of our memory's architecture, including the collective unconscious and the archetypes dwelling within. This emphasis on the unconscious strikes me as speculative at best. Our focus ought to be on observable phenomena. Memory, like any aspect of human psychology, is subject to conditioning. It's the response to stimuli that shapes it, not some nebulous unconscious processes. Ivan, while observable behavior is critical, we cannot ignore the developmental stages of cognition. These stages dictate how memory processes evolve from infancy into adulthood. Understanding these stages is paramount. Gentlemen, while these philosophical discussions possess their charm, let us not stray far from what can be measured and manipulated. The principles of reinforcement and repetition play crucial roles in memory formation and recall. As the founder of experimental psychology, I must advocate for a balanced approach that encompasses careful observation and experimentation. Let us not dismiss the unconscious, but neither should we forsake the rigor of empirical study. Our quest to understand memory spans across the depth of the unconscious to the precision of experimental psychology. Each perspective weaves into the larger understanding, demanding we look beyond our individual proclivities. This discussion promises to unveil novel insights into the intricate workings of memory. Let us begin our deliberation with the unconscious mind and its role in memory formation. Sigmund, your theory places significant emphasis on this aspect. Indeed, Carl. The unconscious mind is the reservoir of desires, fears, and experiences far beyond our conscious awareness. It is crucial in shaping our memories. What we remember, how we remember it, are often dictated by the unresolved conflicts and repressed desires lurking within our unconscious. Interesting. The collective unconscious and its archetypes, in my belief, also play a pivotal role. Memories are not just personal, but are influenced by the inherited structures of the human mind. This talk of the unconscious is unobservable, speculative. Memory as I see it is about observable behavior. Memories are formed and recalled through conditioning, through interaction with the environment. That's where our focus should be. While Skinner makes a valid point about observability, we cannot disregard the underlying processes. The experimental method can yet unveil the influence of the unconscious on memory. Through controlled observation and introspection, even the abstract becomes measurable. Ah, Wilhelm, but you overlook the depth of the unconscious mind. It is not merely about abstract concepts, but about the very fabric of human behavior and memory. Our dreams, slips of the tongue, are windows into this vast, unexplored realm. There's merit to consider both the observable and the abstract. Our understanding of memory must integrate these perspectives. Skinner, what would you propose as a method to observe the unconscious influence empirically? Through experiments focusing on behavior and outcomes. If a specific stimulus consistently results in the recall of a particular memory, then we can study the conditioning irrespective of any supposed underlying unconscious process. This dialogue, while fascinating, sidesteps the developmental aspect. The formation of memory, unconscious or not, evolves with cognitive development. Children, in their assimilation and accommodation processes, might reveal how these unconscious elements interplay with the tangible world. Jan, your point intertwines with my argument. The unconscious mind operates from early childhood, shaping memories and impressions that last into adulthood. The very mechanisms you describe could well be influenced by these unconscious processes. This establishes the foundation of our discussion on memory. Memory is not merely a repository, but a complex interplay of conscious and unconscious processes, observable behavior, and developmental stages. The unconscious mind, with its profound impact, 
remains a critical area for our understanding. Memory and emotions, intertwined yet complex. Jean, your insights on how emotions influence memory consolidation. Indeed, Carl. Our emotional experiences serve as a keystone in memory formation. Vivid memories are often those tied to high emotional states. It's through these experiences that memories cement themselves within our psyche. Ah, but let us not overlook the unconscious aspects. Emotional experiences, especially those with strong effect, sink into the unconscious. They emerge later, disguised in dreams or during moments of Freudian slips, revealing their lasting impact on memory. This emphasis on the unconscious and emotions seems speculative. From a behaviorist standpoint, we must focus on observable behavior. The role of emotions in memory can be seen through reinforcement. Positive emotions reinforce behavior, making it more memorable. Sigmund Skinner presents a critique. Your response? Observable behavior. Skinner you ignore the depth of the human psyche. Emotions and the unconscious mind play a critical role in memory. Our innermost desires and fears shape our memories, whether or not they are immediately observable. While both of you present compelling arguments, we must remember the cognitive aspect. Emotions influence how we encode and retrieve memories. They act as a filter, enhancing or diminishing our memory's clarity. And what of the emotional congruence in memory recall? Precisely. A memory laced with emotion is more easily accessed when we find ourselves in a similar emotional state. It's as if the past emotions beckon us back, allowing for a clearer recall of memories. I concede that emotions play a role in memory recall. However, the process is rooted in reinforcement and conditioning. Emotions prime us for certain responses, thereby facilitating memory retrieval through learned behavior. It's not solely about conditioning, Skinner. Cognitive structures developed through our life experiences work hand-in-hand -hand with emotions to shape and select the memories we retrieve. Fine, but let's not discard the importance of empirical evidence in understanding these processes. Observable outcomes, Gene, provide the foundation for our theories. Wilhelm, your thoughts on methodology in understanding the emotional impact on memory. To truly grasp this interplay, we need empirical, rigorous methods. Experimental psychology allows us to peek into the intricate dance between emotion and memory. Through careful observation and analysis, we can begin to unravel these profound connections. Ah, Wilhelm, but do not forget the depth of the unconscious in this dance. Our emotional memories reside there, influencing us in ways your experiments can hardly capture. A fair point, Sigmund. However, without empirical evidence, we're merely speculating. We must strive for a balance between exploring the unconscious depths and observable phenomena. A riveting exchange. It's clear that emotions profoundly affect memory, whether viewed through a cognitive, behavioral, psychoanalytical, or empirical lens. Each perspective offers critical insights into the intricate nature of memory and emotions. The distinction between short-term and long-term memory processes illuminates much about human cognition. Let's delve into their unique characteristics and mechanisms. Indeed, Carl. Short-term memory, or what I might call the consciousness of the present moment, can only hold a handful of elements simultaneously. It is fleeting, lasting only seconds unless actively maintained. Long-term memory, in contrast, offers a nearly limitless store that can last a lifetime. A fascinating dichotomy, Wilhelm. My work on conditioning demonstrates how repetition transforms short-term memories into long-term stores. It's the ritualistic repetition that cements these memories, akin to how continuous exposure to a stimulus strengthens conditioned responses. While Ivan focuses on the mechanics, we must not overlook cognitive development stages. In children, the processing of memory evolves. Initially, their short-term memory capacities are limited but grow, enabling more complex thought and long-term memory retention as they age. The interplay you describe overshadows the importance of observable behavior in this process. Whether memory becomes long-term or fades into the ether depends largely on the consequences and reinforcements it's associated with, not some unseen cognitive transformation. You all dance around a crucial component, the unconscious. Memories are not simply stored or lost. They are repressed, hidden from consciousness due to their unsettling nature, 
yet influencing behavior from the shadows. Our dialogue is incomplete without acknowledging this force. Sigmund raises an important point regarding the emotional undercurrents that shape memory. However, Wilhelm, how does experimental psychology quantify such unconscious influences? Experimental psychology seeks to isolate variables, Carl, making the ethereal tangible. Through precise measurement and controlled observation, we can glimpse the unconscious's influence on memory. It requires innovative methodology, but is not beyond our grasp. This focus on the experimental and observable is commendable, Wilhelm. Yet, let us not neglect the biological underpinnings. Conditioning is rooted in neural pathways, a bridge between the observable and the internal mechanisms of memory. And amid these discussions, we must consider the developing mind. Cognitive structures in children adapt to accommodate new information, a process integral to transitioning memories from short to long term. Yet, you all seem to overlook the simplicity of this process. Behavior shapes and is shaped by memory, regardless of its tenure. The principles of operant conditioning apply universally, offering a clear framework for understanding memory consolidation without recourse to the metaphysical. Ah, Skinner, your insistence on the observable and tangible is as myopic as it is diligent. The depth of human memory, its intricacies, its deceit, and its dances with the conscious and unconscious realms demand a broader canvas. Our psychic mechanisms, driven by desire and repression, play as crucial a role as any observable behavior in the formation and retention of memories. Let's delve into the intricate world of memory, specifically the phenomenon of false memories and its implications for eyewitness testimony. The human psyche, with all its complexities, often leads us into a labyrinth of real and imagined experiences. Sigmund, would you grace us with your insights into the origins of these so-called false memories? Ah, Carl, it's quite simple, yet profoundly complex. These false memories, they are not mere errors or coincidences. They're manifestations of our deepest desires, fears, repressed experiences. The psyche doesn't discriminate between what happened and what it wishes had happened. Thus, a memory becomes a stage where unconscious desires play their parts. I must interject, Sigmund. While your psychoanalytical approach paints a fascinating picture, we must not drift away from the empirical. The study of memory, especially false memories, demands rigorous experimental methodologies. It's through such scientific rigor that we can begin to discern the mechanisms behind memory inaccuracies. Speaking of methodologies, Wilhelm allow me to pivot towards behaviorism. False memories aren't merely about unseen desires or emotional undercurrents. They're about learning, conditioning, we're taught through reinforcement and repetition to remember things a certain way. Sometimes this leads to the inclusion of information that was never there. This perspective provides us a tangible framework to investigate. Gentlemen, you're all dancing around a critical factor in the development of false memories, cognitive schemas. As we grow, we develop structures in our mind, frameworks to help us process incoming information, but these schemas, they're not infallible. They can lead us to misinterpret or wrongly integrate new information, thus giving birth to what we term false memories. Indeed, Jean, the cognitive framework sheds light on how our mental constructs shape our memory. Now, considering these diverse viewpoints, the implications for eyewitness testimony become glaringly complex. Memory, it seems, is not a simple recording device. How, then, should this inform our justice system? The justice system, Carl. Ha, huh. it's a question of recognizing the theater of the human mind. If the legal institutions continue to naively treat memory as an infallible source of truth, we subject ourselves to the tyranny of error. Our understanding of memory's fallibility must guide judicial processes. While Sigmund dramatizes, he touches on a valid point. The legal system must adapt, integrating psychological research into its practices. Understanding the fallibility of memory, backed by empirical evidence, can lead to reforms in how eyewitness testimonies are evaluated and used. Practical measures, Wilhelm, that's what we need. Training for law enforcement and legal professionals on the limitations of memory, the potential for suggestion, and the importance of preserving the integrity of recall without external influence. And let us not overlook the importance of educating the public about the nature of memory. 
an informed society is better equipped to navigate the complexities of legal and personal challenges related to memory. A spirited discussion, gentlemen. It's clear that the exploration of false memories touches upon the deepest aspects of human psychology and has profound implications for society at large. Each of your perspectives highlights a facet of this multifaceted issue. Memory, with all its quirks and complexities, remains a fertile ground for both inquiry and humility. Let us proceed, ever mindful of the shadows that dance on the walls of the cave. Let's delve into the mechanisms at the heart of memory consolidation, particularly through repetition and rehearsal. The floor is open. To understand memory, one must first appreciate the imperativeness of repeated stimuli. My experiments with dogs demonstrated that conditioning forms the bedrock of associative learning. Repetition serves not merely as reinforcement, but as the very mechanism through which the nascent traces in the cerebral cortex are solidified into long-term memories. Ivan, while your point on classical conditioning's role is well taken, it seems you overlook the breadth of operant conditioning. It's the active, voluntary interactions with our environment, reinforced through repetition and practice, that sculpt our memory. This is not mere passive association, but an active construction of meaning from experience. Both of you speak of conditioning, yet you miss the broader cognitive framework. Repetition and rehearsal are not simply mechanistic drills. They involve a process of actively fitting new information into existing schemas or altering those schemas to accommodate new information. This adaptability is the essence of how we evolve our understanding of the world. The distinction you're making, Gene, is crucial and well-founded. However, we cannot discuss these processes in abstraction. Experimental psychology provides us with a methodology to observe, measure, and quantify these effects. By empirically studying these phenomena, we can discern the conditions under which repetition and rehearsal most effectively enhance memory consolidation. You are all dancing around the periphery of the issue. The task of repetition and rehearsal in the unconscious is far from being mere reinforcement. These are the battlegrounds where the psyche negotiates between desire and reality through a process which I term repression. Memories are not simply formed or strengthened through repetition. They are transformed, imbued with emotional significance, shaped by our deepest conflicts and desires. Sigmund raises a compelling point about the transformational quality of repetition in memory. This is not merely a process of reinforcement, but one of profound psychological significance, where the very fabric of memory is imbued with the indelible mark of the unconscious. Emotional significance or not, the efficacy of repetition and rehearsal in memory consolidation is observable and measurable. Your deepest conflicts and desires are but another variable in the complex equation of learning and memory. The quantifiable effects Skinner mentions and the internal conflicts Sigmund alludes to point towards a composite understanding. The pathways we tread in learning are not merely neural, but are paved with the essence of our experiences and emotions. Conditioning, in its broadest sense, encompasses both the tangible and the ineffable. True, Ivan. The interplay between the cognitive processes and the structured conditioning experiments provides a fertile ground for understanding the nuances of memory through repetition. Our developmental stages and their inherent cognitive capacities deeply influence how these repetitions mold our memory landscape. As much as we argue the mechanisms, it's imperative we don't lose sight of empiricism. Each theory presented here can and should be rigorously tested through experimental psychology. That's the only path to truly understanding the intricacies of memory consolidation via repetition and rehearsal. It is clear then that the role of repetition and rehearsal in memory consolidation is multifaceted, bridging behavioral, cognitive, and psychoanalytic domains. Our diverse perspectives underscore the complexity of memory itself, not merely as a static repository, but as an active, dynamic process. Let us delve into the labyrinthine corridors of how memory's tendrils weaken or strengthen as we amble into the twilight years of our lives. Ivan, might I press you to illuminate how conditioning fares amidst the neural alterations wrought by age? Indeed, Carl, the fundamental principles of classical conditioning persist, 
yet the substrate upon which they operate, the brain, undergoes significant morphological changes. The aged brain's diminished plasticity hampers the formation of new conditioned responses, making it laborious to sculpt new memories or modify old ones. However, Ivan, your focus is overly narrow. From my vantage, cognitive development reveals that with age, the strategies employed for memory retention and retrieval transform. Older individuals may compensate for these neurological deficits by leaning more on semantic memories, which are bolstered by a lifetime of experience. Jean, while your point has merit, from a behaviorist stance, it's crucial to emphasize how environmental adjustments can mitigate the effects of age on memory. Reinforcement strategies need not be static. They can be adapted to suit the evolving capabilities of the aging populace. This conversation skirts around a critical point. The methodology of understanding memory through age necessitates longitudinal studies. Only through such rigorous scientific examination can we discern the patterns of memory's evolution or degradation over the span of a human life. You all dance around the most poignant aspect of this discussion. The unconscious mind harbors desires and fears that suffuse our memories, shaping them irrespective of age. Yet, as we grow older, the opportunity for repression diminishes, and these unconscious elements may surface more readily. The interplay between conscious and unconscious memory and its flux across the age spectrum indeed raises profound questions about the essence of memory itself. Would anyone care to posit how these changes might affect the individual's self-perception or identity? The crux, Carl, lies in how these memory modifications influence cognitive restructuring. As individuals age and their memory faculties evolve, so too does their comprehension of themselves and their world. This can lead to a richer, though sometimes more conflicted, sense of self. Yet we must not overlook the biological underpinnings. The degradation of memory pathways due to aging necessitates a more nuanced understanding of conditioning's role. It is not merely about external stimuli, but how the aging brain's altered state interfaces with these stimuli. The efficacy of operant conditioning in navigating the challenges posed by aging is undeniable. Adjustments in reinforcement can significantly enhance the quality of life, underscoring behaviorism's practical applicability in addressing memory-related declines. The dialogue you all engage in underlines the imperative for interdisciplinary research. Without a holistic approach, our grasp of memory's vicissitudes through age remains incomplete. Experimental psychology, neurology, and developmental studies must converge to unravel this enigma. Memory's intertwinement with unconscious processes underscores the psychodynamic vista. As the self evolves over time, so does the shadow it casts, evoking a profound recalibration of the individual's psyche. This, I argue, is where the essence of understanding memory through the lens of aging lies. Each perspective melds to form a kaleidoscopic view of memory through the ages, underscoring the multifaceted nature of this phenomenon. As we forge ahead, let us bear in mind the complexity of memory's dance with time, ever evolving, ever enigmatic. The night whispers its secrets to us through our dreams, its tendrils shaping our memories. Let us consider how sleep and dreaming serve the architecture of memory. Sigmund, you've elucidated the importance of dreams in your work. Indeed, Carl, dreams are the royal road to the unconscious. They are not mere byproducts of sleep, but a crucial mechanism through which the unconscious mind sorts, processes, and influences memory consolidation. Dreams reveal desires and fears that have been suppressed, entwining these elements with our memories. A fascinating standpoint, dreams as a means to integrate memories with our deeper selves. Ivan, your thoughts on how this aligns or conflicts with conditioned responses? Dreams, from my perspective, are less about the psychoanalytical mystique. Consider the stages of sleep. Classical conditioning is evident in how sleep stages reinforce learning and memory consolidation. It's not about hidden desires, but about the physiological processes that underpin memory. This theory of dreams processing suppressed desires is abstract and unfounded in observable behavior. Memory and learning are shaped by reinforcement and repetition. The role of sleep, I argue, is less about mystical integration and more about biological necessity for memory consolidation. But we cannot overlook developmental aspects. 
Sleep is critical in cognitive development. It's during sleep that children's brains assimilate new information, moving from assimilation to accommodation. It is a continuous restructuring of memory and knowledge. Ah, but you're missing the profound depth of dream interpretation. It's not just reinforcement, but the symbolic resolution of conflicts that shapes our memories during sleep. A contentious viewpoint, indeed. Wilhelm, how do we bridge these diverse perspectives with experimental psychology? The challenge lies in devising studies that accurately capture the complexities of dreams, sleep, and memory. While the unconscious and symbolic interpretations hold theoretical value, our focus should be on empirical methods to study the impact of sleep stages on memory consolidation. Precisely, empirical evidence is key. My experiments with dogs demonstrated how conditioned responses can be formed. Similar principles may apply to how sleep phases contribute to strengthening neural pathways. And yet, despite our differing views, we can agree that mechanisms of repetition, whether through conditioning or rehearsal during sleep, play a pivotal role in memory consolidation. But let us not reduce the rich tapestry of the human psyche to mere observable behaviors. The mystery of dreams and their influence on memory merit deeper exploration beyond the confines of empirical evidence. Herein lies the essence of our debate. The enigma of sleep and dreams touches upon the innate complexity of memory, from the biological to the psychological and beyond. Our journey to unravel these mysteries is far from over. Let us delve into the influence of environment and context on memory retrieval. Wilhelm, would you start us off with your experimental psychology stance on environmental cues? Indeed, Carl. Through meticulous observation and experimental rigor, it is evident that environmental cues serve as a key to unlocking specific memories. These cues, be they olfactory, visual, or auditory, create a bridge to past experiences, vividly bringing them to the forefront of consciousness. Ah, Wilhelm, but you skirt around the profound unconscious dimension these cues tap into. An aroma, a melody, they do not merely create a bridge, but awaken the deepest desires and fears lodged within our unconscious, affecting not only memory recall, but the very fabric of these memories. Sigmund brings an intriguing perspective on the unconscious. Ivan, how do these ideas sit within the realm of your conditioning research? Let us not get ensnared in the nebulous realm of the unconscious without evidence. My experiments demonstrate how context and environmental stimuli condition the nervous system, leading to a predictable response. The significance of the context is not in its mystery, but in its capacity to be a signal, a trigger that elicits a specific conditioned response. Even while your point is well taken, it leans heavily on the notion of passive response. I argue that the environment not only triggers memories, but actively shapes and reinforces them. Through operant conditioning, the environment rewards or punishes, thus influencing how and which memories are formed and recalled. You all dance around a critical component, the development of the individual's cognitive framework. As children explore their environments, they assimilate new experiences and accommodate existing schemas. These contexts are not merely triggers or conditions, but integral to the very construction of memory. It is the interaction with the environment that molds our memory. Jean, while your developmental lens is commendable, you neglect the darker corners of the mind where memory and desire intertwine, influenced by factors beyond mere cognitive development. Gentlemen, we tread on complex ground, merging the empirical with the abstract. Skinner, your emphasis on the environment's active role in shaping memory suggests a more dynamic interaction than mere classical conditioning. Precisely, Carl. Human behavior, and consequently memory, is not a simple stimulus-response mechanism. It is an intricate dance with the environment, where consequences of our actions in that context shape future behavior and memory retrieval. Yet we must not abandon the pursuit of understanding these phenomena through systematic study and experimentation. The intertwining of context, memory, and behavior demands a rigorous empirical approach. This discussion showcases the multifaceted nature of memory, where unconscious desires, behavioral responses, and cognitive development are all interwoven with the contextual cues from our environment. The exploration of memory's dependence on context confirms its complexity, 
and our need for diverse methodologies to unravel its mysteries. Let us delve into the neurobiological mechanisms underlying memory storage. Ivan, your research with conditioned responses has been foundational. Would you care to elucidate how neural pathways are strengthened through repeated use? Indeed, Carl. Through my experiments on classical conditioning, it's clear that neural pathways become more efficient with repetition. As a bell is rung before food is presented to a dog, so does the neural circuitry in the brain become more apt to trigger the salivation response. This is not mere behaviorism. It is the embodiment of neural plasticity. Conditioning, yes. But let's not meander into the oversimplifications of complex neural activities. Our observable outcomes tell us that behaviors change, this much is clear. Yet to claim understanding of the neural intricacies without measurable evidence from behavior itself is, quite frankly, stepping beyond our bounds. Yet, Skinner, for a comprehensive understanding of memory, we cannot ignore the underlying cognitive processes which your observable outcomes hint at. Recent neurodevelopmental findings suggest brain structures support this cognitive processing in a more intricate manner than previously understood. Both of you hold points of merit, but it is through methodical experimentation we may truly grasp these underpinnings. The marriage of experimental psychology with emerging neurobiology provides us a lens to observe not just the outward behaviors, but the internal mechanisms at play. The brain is a complex organ after all. Ah. But gentlemen, we skate around the most fascinating part of the dialogue. Memory is not merely the repetition of stimuli or the spark of neural pathways. There exists, beneath the surface, a tumultuous sea of unconscious desires and fears. The memory, stored or repressed, is often a manifestation of these unseen forces. The biological mechanisms are but one layer. The depth of the human psyche contains the rest. Sigmund raises an intriguing point. The neurobiological mechanisms are pivotal, yet they interact with elements of the unconscious mind. Our understanding of memory storage must then, perforce, consider the convergence of the neural and the psychological. Can we not, in this modern era, seek to bridge these disciplines to fully understand the essence of memory? While intriguing, Carl, the task remains to identify these interactions in a manner that withstands rigorous scientific scrutiny. Our studies on neural pathways offer a starting point, but the journey ahead is long and fraught with complexity. And as we venture forth, let us remain steadfast in our commitment to what can be observed, measured, and replicated. For in this endeavor, our theories must ultimately yield to the empirical evidence before us, no matter how deeply it may delve into the brain's labyrinth. Indeed, the discourse has ventured into territories both vast and intricate. Our understanding of memory, while enriched, remains unfinished. It is this pursuit of knowledge that propels us forward through the synthesis of our diverse perspectives. Now let us pivot to the influence of modern technology and digital media on human memory. Skinner, your behaviorist perspective suggests an external conditioning mechanism. Elaborate, if you would. Indeed, Carl. Technology, particularly digital media, serves as a potent form of operant conditioning. The immediate feedback loops, likes, retweets, notifications, they reinforce behaviors and, by extension, influence memory patterns. People are more likely to remember content that has been reinforced through social validation than content that hasn't. While Skinner touches on an important aspect, it's crucial not to overlook the cognitive shift occurring. The ease of access to information has altered the very fabric of memory. Our brains are no longer repositories of information, but have evolved to process and apply information. The skill set required today is vastly different from that of yesteryears, focusing on creativity and critical thinking over rote memorization. Ah, but what both of you neglect is the unconscious impact of this technological omnipresence. The sea of information at our fingertips feeds into our desires, fears, and ultimately shapes our memories in unseen ways. The content we consume, often unknowingly, nests within our unconscious, influencing our dreams, our slips of the tongue, perhaps even our very perception of self and reality. Fascinating points. Wilhelm, how do you view these changes from the lens of experimental psychology? The key, gentlemen, is empirical evidence. 
we must rigorously study the effects of digital media on memory through controlled experimentation. Only then can we truly understand the impact. This technology, it's not merely an external force acting upon us. It interacts with the psychological processes at the very core of memory formation and recall. We must devise methods to quantify and analyze these interactions. All of you dance around the most pressing issue, the transformation of neural pathways through repeated use and interaction with technology. My work with conditioned responses shows that repetition strengthens neural connections. Thus, frequent interaction with digital media must be rewiring our brains, altering how memories are not only formed, but also how they are retrieved. It appears then that each perspective, from psychoanalytic to behaviorist, cognitive, experimental, and even physiological, contributes a piece to this intricate puzzle of memory in the digital age. Yet this discourse also uncovers the complexity and the vast scope of inquiry that remains. As memory evolves with society and technology, so too must our theories and methods of understanding it. Let us distill the essence of today's discussions. While we have traversed many avenues, the multifaceted nature of memory remains. Your final thoughts, gentlemen. Memory, as we have debated, is not merely a repository of facts, but a complex interplay of unconscious desires and defenses. Our understandings of it, limited by the confines of our own theories, must evolve. The unconscious mind, a concept some of you disdain, plays a pivotal role shaping memory in ways that transcend simple behavioral observations. My esteemed colleague's fixation on the unconscious aside, we must not lose sight of the observable and measurable. Memories, like all human behavior, are subject to the laws of conditioning. Our understanding of memory will remain incomplete if we ignore its empirical examination. Experimentation, not introspection, is the path to understanding. Both points, while valid, skim the surface of the developmental complexities. Memory evolves, shaped by the cognitive structures that themselves mature through active engagement with the environment. To ignore the stages of cognitive development in discussing memory is to view the ocean merely as water. Indeed, the methodologies we employ in dissecting memory's nature cannot be monolithic. Experimental psychology provides us tools, yet our interpretations must remain nimble integrating findings across disciplines. Our discussions highlight the necessity for a nuanced approach to understanding memory. It is not a singular entity, but a constellation of processes, each worthy of rigorous exploration. Let us not overlook the basic principles of conditioning in our discourse on memory. The mechanisms by which memories are formed, retained, and retrieved can be illuminated by classical and operant conditioning models. The pendulum swings between the internal and observable, yet both are crucial in understanding the tapestry of memory. Memory, it seems, is as diverse in its constitution as the perspectives brought to bear upon it today. The richness of our discourse underscores the complex interplay of biological, psychological, and social factors in memory. This discussion, vigorous and at times contentious, reflects the vibrancy of memory research. Our collective endeavor must be to forge ahead, challenging and refining our theories in light of new discoveries. Let us agree, at least, on the boundlessness of our quest for understanding.